Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. Sponsored, as always, by BetterHelp.com. I'm Kevin Kelton. Tonight, Ward Anderson is off this week, but as always, I'm still joined by Greg Matusak. Hi, Kevin. I'm having a pretty good night, at least better than uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. (laughs) I don't know if you knew that one. Literally, I just got the text on this. Uh, He's been ousted from power, so I think... I am having a better. I just had nachos. Um, <laughs> but like I said, I'm having better night than at least one person in this world. So, Also here with us is Lily Koo. Hi, Lily. Hi, Kevin. And, you know, as you know, I'm a millennial, so I'm still trying to pay off my student loans without having a nine to five job. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that people can do that. I'll tell you a story about that sometime. And joining us is a good friend of mine, a neighbor of mine that I met when I moved to Texas, Eric Robinson. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's good to be here. It's nice to see the other members, Greg and Lily. I'm excited to jump in and see what's happening. And I tend to agree with Greg that I think Netanyahu's not a happy man today. (laughs) Anyways, I want to give uh, Eric a little opportunity to tell us about uh, his area of expertise, who he is, what he does. Eric, as I know, and I'm going to share with our audience, you are a professor of psychology at Baylor University, correct? That is correct. That is correct. And you teach in the master's program. You don't you don't bother with those undergrads, those sleazy undergrads. This, to some extent, I actually do teach undergraduates, and, and I oh. actually I teach in uh, it's it's in the, the department of educational psychology, which is always very confusing. My 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 expertise is in school psychology. And so most people don't know what that is. They think, oh, you're talking to a school counselor, which isn't true. Or they say the school of psychology, which isn't accurate either. So we're, we're a, a, a wonderful group of people that are pretty invisible out there, unfortunately. So, but yeah, school psychologists work in the public schools with kids uh, legally from three to 21 years of age with special education students or students with special needs, but also with general education students. So I direct um, our eat, our specialist program, which is like a master's program, as Kevin said. I moved to Baylor um, in Texas from the, my last stop was at the University of Kansas. I got my PhD, so I'm a Jayhawk, but I grew up in the Carolinas. So if you're wondering about the Appalachia Hick accent, this is it. <laughs> you know, the hillbilly moonshine NASCAR area of North Carolina is where I'm from. Cool, cool. And one of the reasons I'm excited to have Eric on is his background in education. And Greg has talked many times about his background in uh, is high school secondary education. Is it considered secondary? I've actually I've actually taught kindergarten through. I've actually taught college classes before. So someone gave me college classes for like three summers. I taught at a local university. Um, and so I have and, I have a I wide one breath. semester at college, so yeah. we're all college professors. Well, <laughs> they didn't call me. They I was a visiting. No, I'm not yeah, a trust me, not a professor. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've taught I've taught like you name it. I've taught it as far as music goes, um, and I t- teach. I still teach privately. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, but it's it's nothing like uh, educational psychology. I mean, it's it's music. It's a lot of clapping. I teach kids how to clap. <laughs> And Lily, other than the fact that you've obviously been a student, what's your background in education? Um, I, I've actually been teaching since I was in high school, um, mostly oh. kids in theater. So I've taught acting classes since I was in high school. So I have also s- taught special education students because a lot of them were actually, they had ADHD. And um, uh, I would often uh, be put with the students with ADHD because... I have ADHD, so I knew how to have them pay attention in my classes. So I would just use methods on them that I knew worked on me. <laughs> what, what what methods worked on you? Um, for well, they were fine in the actual part of the classes where we would actually be doing scenes. It was the part where they actually had to sit and listen for a whole lecture uh, that would go on for about thirty minutes to an hour, and so I would 
I would ask them to create a story based on what they heard and lecture and tell me the story at the end of the class. And if they were having extra trouble paying attention to wiggle their toes in their shoes while they were sitting in their chair and that helped them stay in their seat. And everyone was so dumbfounded. How did you get them to not run around in class? They were running <laughs> around. They were just in their chair while they were doing it. Wow. It's great. So, sounds like a great strategy. Um, yeah. I was also going to say that, that um, is, it, is it accurate, Greg, to say that you're, you're a, a music teacher? Is that yes. true? Yeah, 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 yeah. From uh, from Miami University, the the real Miami, the one in Oxford. That's Ohio. right, the one in Oxford. That's Actually, right. we have one of one of our current students is a graduate of Miami. Yeah, love and she honor. Came down to Texas. I will yeah, tell yeah. her. You know, but it's interesting. Both of the topics you both brought up that your your professions, because when students with special needs are in the public schools, are often kind of put into the quote regular education classrooms or we hear mainstream was a word we've heard in the past they they're often tested out in like music classes and theater classes and art classes so i'm assuming greg you've seen a a high number of students with special needs come through because that's kind of one of the first places that that schools will see how kids do outside of a special education class you know it's funny because i've been teaching long enough that it is now it was it's now coming, of course, back then, but 20 years ago, they were taking special needs students out of my class and using that time for extra, you know, um, time with tutoring or whatever, because they didn't feel like music or art or were beneficial. Uh, it was, it was always a struggle. And now it's, of course, like you said, it's pretty, you know, this is where it works out. Um, but 20 years ago, music was like one of the first things they cut, um, you know, and of course, Jim wasn't because, you know, Jim, don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you had a thought. Yeah, you know, I think that's that's an interesting point because it really sometimes depended on the severity of the disability. So, But you're right. The kids that we thought had academic promise, you're right. They would pull kids out of what were, quote, non-academic classes and put them in two, two doses of reading a day, once during their reading period and once during their music class, right? Yeah. But then the kids that we thought were more severe, what we call intellectually disabled today, we used to call them mentally retarded years ago, but the intellectually disabled students, when they would try to see how they could, how they could socialize, they would, they would go to music classes and art classes, again, to not disrupt the, quote, academic courses. So you were that you were kind of the test case on both ends. Oh right, I've, I I've, I'm, I I know everyone thinks that I'm the spring chicken, like that Lily and I are the millennials. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm older than I look, and uh, oh yeah, yeah, I, I've seen it all. Um, my my uncle who grew up in my house uh, had Down syndrome, so it was something I always fought for. It was something that I was very used to. It was something I felt comfortable, um, and you know. So this was something that I thought should be included. You know, music therapy was, I didn't go into music therapy, but it was a route that I thought about for a little while. Um, but then, you know, I, I've always loved teaching. Um, that was without a doubt. Like I said, I still teach privately just to keep my, you know, foot in the game. Foot in the game? Is that a thing? Yeah. Well, yeah. Foot, well, no. No. <laughs> no I'm, now I'm just making up stuff. Foot in, the, foot in the door, what, maybe. You're not putting any bull, balls in any hoops or anything. You're just you're putting your balls foot on in the, the court air, a little bit and it. then running foot off the, the court. Yeah, running off. <laughs> so the reason that I thought it, this is a great week to have uh, all of us on because we all have an education background in some sense is because of the stories that we're hearing about uh, the teaching or sometimes the lack of teaching of critical race theory in our schools. Apparently in Texas, where, where Eric and I live, there's been some backlash and the governor is trying to, or maybe he already has, uh, signed a law that would make it uh, illegal to teach critical race theory. Is that right, Eric? I I, th- I don't think he has signed it yet. I don't think our governor signed it. I think it's on his desk. I believe there's maybe four or five states that it has been signed. Our neighbors to the north, Oklahoma, their governor has signed the document to, to prohibit this, um, but I, it's on the desk of, of Greg Abbott, and I anticipate he will sign it whenever he makes it back to his desk. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is this is their this is their hot button issue this year. You know, um, 20 years ago, it would be like gay marriage. And, you know, 10 years ago, it was transgender bathrooms. And this year, um, you know, five years ago or eight years ago, it might have been new math. Like new math. <laughs> so scary. From California. Is that, is right, that, right. Is that Which, different than fuzzy math? Yeah, exactly. And I, re- I remember actually having to explain new math to a group of parents, and they were like, but I don't understand it. And I was like, no, you don't. And they're like, but I can't. I was like, but but your kids do. But anyways, so every year they come up with these hot button issues, which always end up to be, you know, like scary. And But in the end, they're actually really good program. I mean, they're really good. I mean, gay marriage is a good thing. Um, you know, now 70% of the country accepts it. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and you know, um, so yeah, this is, this is just something that's, like I said, one of the dumbest, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, it makes good pol- politics, but yeah. It, well, let, let, let's first do this. Does anybody want to take a crack at explaining to our audience who maybe isn't quite up to speed on this? Uh, anybody want to take a crack at explaining what critical race theory is or means? Oh, um, do you, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, like, <laughs> the, the, the definition that racism is a social construct. So, in essence, things like the legal system is racist. And we know that. We've seen this. We have the data. Um, if you're a black man, you are not going to get a fair shake compared to a white man. That's proven. Housing. Um, if you have a traditional black name and you are trying to rent from a co-op board, okay, and you put that in, you are not going to get a fair shake as much as a traditional white name. Um, hiring. All these things. These are traditional social constructs, okay? Right, right. And these are all inherently racist in America, okay? Even dating apps, so I think the basic, the way I synthesized it down in my mind is, if you believe that there's systemic racism, you believe in critical race theory. Well, it's it's it, it's kind of a gimme off where a lot of people say, well, I'm not racist. That's fine. And they say, well, I'm not racist, so there is no racism. That's your typical conservative. I treat everybody the same. I don't see color, which is a horrible thing to say. Um, so they get away with saying, so there is no racism, but the problem is there is racism built into these systems. Okay. Exactly. 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 Okay. People are not getting promoted the same and we, and it's not a question of, well, that's just how you see it. Tests are biased because they're written predominantly by Caucasians. Right. That type of thing. The biggest issue that we're seeing with this, uh, the backlash, well, we can talk about the backlash, but that's pretty much where we're coming from, okay? Um, and it's a theory, because it's critical race theory, is that a lot of white people are afraid that it's anti-white, which it's not. It's not that white people are keeping people down. It's just we need to do better. Interestingly, it's really just the opposite, because it, what it's saying is, We're not blaming you for being, you know, Bull Connor. We're not blaming you for being Archie Bunker. We're saying the world that we all live in is, by its very nature, tilted against certain minorities. Therefore, it's not necessarily an individual who's to blame, but rather the system that we were all born into. Right. Does that make sense to you, Eric? Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think, though, but but I think one of the issues is that who who has built this system in our country? And it's going to be... I think Lily did. Okay, well, I thought she probably did. But, <laughs> millennials. Uh, she looks like a builder. It sounds like millennials. <laughs> they, they, they do a lot. Yeah, but I think it's the system is, that, is that, that, you know, white people and primarily white men have built this system. So when you go back and look at public policy, legal situations, as, as, as Greg described, those are ultimately decided by a bunch of white men typically. 
So I think that you're right. It's, it's easy to say, if you understand it, that this is a systemic issue that we all need to acknowledge. But it has become kind of a flashpoint between conservatives and liberals. And I do think it's, a, it's kind of a conservative, kind of a litmus test. If you're in the camp of the conservatives, you're, you're not for critical race theory. If you're, not, if you're not in the camp of conservatives or however we're calling them today, whether conservatives or Trump, Trump people or not, we can discuss that too. But if you're definitely a Trump person, you're probably anti-critical race theory and, and probably, again, don't know really what it is. And it, it is, it's kind of hard to define. I think Greg did a great job, but it's a little nebulous at times in how people interpret it. But it has become a buzzword or catchphrase to, to, for people to say this is an anti-white theory and, and do not teach it in schools. Now, Lily, you're on the podcast with three older white guys. Uh, you don't fall into that category. Do you have anything that – have we missed anything on this particular topic? The reason why I think it's incredibly important to educate everyone about, about how race incredibly impacts different demographics is because – if it's not taught in the school system, you can't assume that it will be learned. Um, growing up in a melting pot myself, I was fortunate and privileged enough within my family to learn how race impacts. And just by your skin tone, just myself, my skin tone fluctuates dramatically. I have experienced racism just by my hairstyle and my skin tone. Uh, when my skin gets dark enough and my hair gets curly and tight enough or dark enough or froey enough. Just for our listeners who've never seen you, you identify as an Asian Latina American, correct? Yes, I'm Vietnamese, um, Puerto Rican and American. And um, because I'm multicultural and multi multi-ethnic uh, genetically, I, I fluctuate a lot. So I, I can be white passing even, but I can also look very, very non-white passing. And I've experienced racism, but I've also gotten away with things. So I've experienced it myself, but also within my family, I have people who are black, people who are Puerto Rican, people who are Vietnamese, and people who are um, Latina and Latinos. So uh, Latinx, I, I've seen it all, but that's my privilege of being able to see this firsthand and how it impacts people. Not everyone has that experience. So it's really important that this education is widespread throughout the, the education system. So people who are living in K Kentucky or Idaho or maybe ha have families who are completely white or they don't have a diverse experience can be educated on how, um, how their families are impacted um, and how that impacts their ability to get a job how that impacts their ability to even be accepted to eat at a certain restaurant or go to a certain venue. There's a lot of racism that isn't explicitly racism uh, or, or be accepted, you know, to any to anything. So I do think it's very important. Yeah, yeah. But this whole thing that we're talking about, we're talking about it on our side, just definitions and discussions, I got, I got into a discussion with someone from, and like Eric was saying, do we call them, you know, the Trumpistas? Do we call them the conservative? We'll call them conservatives for now. Um, and they asked me, they said, as an educator, are you being forced to teach this critical race theory? And I said, well, I teach music. So, and they're like, oh, so they're going to teach you, make you play jazz now or blues. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? That's not critical race theory. And he's like, I just, I just feel like, you know, you know, everything's being erased and, you know, they're going to go for our monuments and our history. And I was like, that's not critical race theory. It's like, they don't have a concept and it's like all their nightmares. Oh wait, they're afraid that they're going to become a minority, which sounds like a nightmare to them because of how they've treated. Wait for it minorities <laughs> you know so yeah that was that was a horrible 
horrible conversation. He ended up calling me. Uh, I don't want to get have to keep getting bleeped. And after last week's clip show, I swear a lot. So I'm not going to tell you. What. <laughs> well, I, you know, one of the things that's come up over the last few weeks since the anniversary of the Tulsa massacre is so many people saying, why was I never taught this in school? I know personally, I had never heard of it until very recently. I think maybe a year ago uh, in the wake of the George Floyd murder, which we may talk about later. um, That was the first time I had ever heard of it. And I've seen person after person, either in the media or friends of mine or people on, on social media saying the same thing. Eric, had you heard of it before? Greg, Lily, had you heard of it before? Which one? Uh, I'll, I'll well, I'll go. Well, the okay? t- let's say the Tulsa massacre. Yeah, um, I, I will say uh, no. I had not as a white man. I had not. Um, but I, I think one of the issues that we can we can pick that up. I want to hear from the other two members here. But I would like to come back at some point and talk about kind of why I think this isn't being taught. But I'll let other people kind of chime in and answer your question. Um, yes, I'd heard about the Tulsa massacre. I had read about it in a book because I got beat up a lot and I was forced to read books as a kid. <laughs> um, and I figured, you know, it would keep me from getting, it didn't work. Um, I, I knew about Juneteenth for a long time. For those of you who don't know what Juneteenth is, look it up. It's, it's kind of horrible in its own way, but it's also a celebration of the last, um, uh, in Texas, um, for those people in Texas, they uh, after the slaves were f- freed, um, they kept them. They didn't tell anyone till another season because uh, it's horrible. Um, and the Tuskegee experiments, for example, that was something I didn't know about until a movie uh, I saw years later. Um, so, I mean, there were things I knew maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, but these are things I should have probably knew about in school. Um, you know, but yeah. Oh, in school, that's super racist too. (laughs) Okay. That's, that's a whole other area. And Lily, what about you? I think that it's about damn time that everyone starts learning about real accurate history in this country. And that by doing this, it's going to create a whole generation of people who are empathetic, compassionate, and aware. And that, It's going to be good to have a whole generation of people who look around and who can truly and genuinely and sincerely connect with each other and understand each other instead of creating a continuous divide of fear and a misunderstanding and uh, fear to even talk to each other. By learning more and more about each other, everyone's going to finally be able to communicate and understand each other and create opportunities for each other and create that equality. And it sounds to me like the only people who do not want this to happen are people who are benefiting from white privilege who don't want to share. Okay. So, uh, Eric, you said you had a theory, no pun intended, as to why critical race theory and things like the Tulsa massacre aren't being taught in schools. Yeah, well, yeah. My belief is that, you know, sc- Our government allows states to run education. It's just kind of a state's rights, as we know that. Um, So each state gets to determine what curriculum they want. And we have state boards of education across the country. We have education agencies in Texas. It's called the Texas Education Agency, so TEA. Ohio is probably OEA, for all I know. California is CEA. So we have all these groups, but they have school boards, statewide school boards, but even then, they primarily give curricular rights to local school boards or local education agencies. And so, so in Texas, we have over 1,200 school districts. So in theory, you could have 1,200 different types of curricula being taught and, and with, with some guidance to it. You know, the state could give some guidance. The federal government attempts to at times, and you've seen, you know, sometimes on a continuum of they want to have a national curriculum and then people push back. The, we don't need a national curriculum because... The, the federal government doesn't run education, and then it's up to state. So there's always this battle back and forth. So I think the issue is that, that who establishes curriculum, some boundaries by the state, more by local, local school boards. 
but there's a curriculum created because now every every school or every state has a, a state test that they have to give. I'm sure Greg can speak to this in Ohio. Lily probably had to take this, but when you look at the three old white guys here, we probably took a nationally standardized achievement test. Iowa test basic skills, metropolitan achievement test, California achievement test. We took those nationally standardized tests, but now we wouldn't do that today. We would do what Lily did, which was take a state-driven test. So California has this test, Oregon has this test, Washington has this test. And so the state gives you boundaries. And so to, you have to do well on these tests or the state, you're in trouble by the state, in essence. It's a simple way to say it. So, so they teach whatever the curriculum says, whatever the state standards are for tests. I'm not saying they teach the tests, but they teach a curriculum aligned with these tests. And these tests clearly have not had the Tulsa Massacre. They don't, they don't have these things in there. Now, who's creating these tests and who's creating the curriculum? Again, probably a bunch of white men and women in that order. So I think that's the issue. It's, it, it would be wonderful for us to have a national curriculum, and we're having a conversation about it, but, but with, with critical race theory. The thing I think is unusual, we have to pay close attention to, is that um, it's rare for governors to come in and try to tell states what they can teach and what they can't, because it's really up to the local schools. But it's very intimidating for a governor to sign a document to say, you can or you cannot teach this in your state. So I think we have to pay close attention to this pushback we're seeing because this is, I can't say it's unprecedented, but it's very rare to see something like that. You know, the other thing that you may not have mentioned is the uh, the school book industry also has this huge effect. You mean the textbook industry? Textbook industry, yeah. Right. Uh, because um, we always want to go, and it's it's difficult. No school wants to build their own textbook, and so we have to go with well, you know, this is the book that we're all using and whatnot. What's kind of interesting though is a lot of textbook people go with. I don't know if you know this, the Texas because Texas is the largest one. Whatever Texas is teaching, whatever their curriculum, they change, and they will go with that. So. Texas pretty much dictates a lot of what the entire country does. And thereby market forces. In other words, you're saying they will sell more textbooks if they please the market yep. with what's in the textbook. And they're not as interested in, in about factual and uh, being factual as selling textbooks. No, they have to be factual. Okay, that they are impor- important, but they will but take out... biased in terms of what they decide to cover. How much, how much weight is given... Okay, like they may say, oh, by the way, there was this thing that happened in Tulsa and just maybe a sentence. Okay, and it was bad. (laughs) Right. If that if that Um, and but then they'll give like like, you know, just huge, huge amounts on the Civil War and about, you know, how it really, really wasn't. Here's here's all the reasons why the Civil War was fought and slavery was number 12, you know. (laughs) <laughs> Correct. You're exactly right. Texas drives the school, the textbook industry in the country. And you're right. Their things are factual, but they're not comprehensive. And I think that's what Lily was speaking to, is that, you know, you can leave a lot of things out and have a factual book. Exactly. Or put weight, more weight to something. If you've got a chapter that there's one sentence that this is super important. Why didn't we talk more about this? And if we are studying for a test and Ninety percent is about Washington's horse's name. I would think Washington <laughs> horse's name is super important in history. By the way, it was Trigger. Um, <laughs> I did not go to a good school. I did not I go into, to a good school. <laughs> this is the reason I got into an argument with my history teacher in high school about the Vietnam War. Tell us about that, please. Yeah. Um, (laughs) well, I grew up with the Vietnam refugee as my mother telling me about her experience firsthand with the Vietnam War and how, and, uh, it wasn't lining up with what I was learning in history class from my teacher about the Vietnam War. Uh, So I'd love to hear more about that because you actually made a great segue into one of our next topics, which is today, actually, as we're, as we're recording this is the 50th anniversary of the publishing of the Pentagon Papers. Now, uh, I'm probably the only one here that has a vivid memory of that. Uh, Eric is a few years younger than me, and Greg is 
drops down another decade after that. But uh, Lily, tell us what you know about the Vietnam War because of your ancestry that is being taught incorrectly in the schools that at least you went to. Okay, well, um, so when I was growing up, I was told when I was complaining uh, by my mother, well, at least you still have your limbs because when she was a child, she witnessed firsthand uh, civilians that were innocent in her Southern Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, she was in Saigon community, They also did travel around. And the story of that is they were basically Vietnamese hippies. So my family, um, they're musicians, artists, and actors. They're entertainers, much like me, but in Vietnam. And they would put on shows, theatrical shows in random fields. They would carry these big wagons that they would fill with um, theatrical stages and props and makeup and costumes. And they would hide the men in barrels underneath these so that when soldier, when, when the government would come to, to um, pull the men out to fight in the war, they would say, we don't have any men. All we have is these props, costumes. We're just a traveling carnival. <laughs> and uh, just these women and these barrels. And um, uh, as they were traveling, my mother would see uh, innocent South Vietnamese civilians with their limbs blown off by bombs that U.S. military dropped on the wrong fields and on the wrong parts of her country in Vietnam because they couldn't distinguish between which areas of the country to bomb when they were trying to quote unquote help during the Vietnam War. And then when I went to school and they were teaching about the Vietnam War, the U.S. are these great heroes and they went to Vietnam to help fight communism and they were there to help. They helped South Vietnam (laughs) and uh, they were, they were there to try to help. And, um, I, I tried to give my two cents and it wasn't welcomed. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as people found out when the Pentagon Papers were published, everything, well, not everything, but a lot of what Americans had been told about the Vietnam War turned out to be falsehoods or greatly shaded, uh, uh, you know, uh, information that... Uh, that gave the war a whole new meaning. And again, I know you guys know about this. I guess I'm pulling a little, you know, get off my lawn, (laughs) you know, baby boomer thing here. But to have lived through that, I mean, I remember, even though I, you know, didn't read the New York Times because I was about 13, 14, 15 years old when the Pentagon Papers came out, but you were aware from the news coverage. It was the first time that Americans realized that their government lied to them. And that is why, and that is why you are the greatest generation, Kevin. (laughs) No, I am not the greatest generation. My dad was the greatest generation. But anyways, let's move on to other stuff that happened in the news this week. The Trump DOJ, uh, we found out, uh, subpoenaed Apple and other, um, Uh, media companies, uh, internet companies, to try to get information on Trump's political foes, including seizing uh, the phone records and and email logs for reporters from the New York Times, the Washington Post, both of who published the Pentagon Papers, CNN. And people on the left are outraged because people on the left are always outraged. And people on the right are just going, yeah, so what of it? If they were leaking stuff, there should have been an investigation into them. Who cares? Yeah, you know, what? What? so they got caught. Of course they got caught because (laughs) no one said they were criminal masterminds. Um, They just said they were criminals. Um, They got caught because they when they when they there was a gag order on all of this and they said apple there's a gag order for like 4 years or 3 years and the gag order was then lifted and then they notified all these people they said oh by the way we've been spying on you for the past couple of years and many of these people this was this all had to do originally at least this round with the russian leaks okay so 
Trump wanted to know, like, who's leaking all this information about me and Russia? Um, I don't like this. This is making me look bad. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like this. So then he and while he was doing this, he said, hey, can I go after other people? And there were people who were not even in the intelligence community who had nothing to do with this at all. He, well, they did it to Don McGahn, his own White House counsel. Well, he thought he might have been leaking the information. <laughs> I mean, true. I, I can see that. I know, but the but the level of uh, um, paranoia, you know, it, it's uh, Kim Jong Un level paranoia. Well, right. That's that's. I mean, if you're in for a penny, you know, in for a lot more. You know, in for a buck fifty, <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah. The thing that drives me crazy about this is, again, listen, we all know that there's hypocrisy on both sides of the political spectrum. Conservatives can be hypocrites, and let's face it, liberals can be hypocrites too. No one gets a pass at this. But I'm just so amused that when it's clear that the government, and in this case, the Trump administration, was essentially attacking the First Amendment. And conservatives have no problem with that. But if, gosh forbid, anybody should talk about universal background checks or limiting the size of automatic weapon magazines, then, oh my God, they want to, uh, they want to abolish the Second Amendment. They only care about protecting the Second Amendment. The Constitution only counts when it's their beloved Second Amendment. The other nine or 27 amendments, however many we have now, nobody cares about <laughs> Um, that doesn't bother me so much as the fact that they actually broke these laws. <laughs> I mean, I guess they, they, they did follow the laws, but they were going after people who had nothing to do with nothing. And those are violations. The inspector general, inspector general is actually holding, is going to hold hearings on this. Um, there is no way that this is not, is just going to be like, what are you going to do? We were scamps. Um, you know, now, will Trump go to jail for this? Of course not. Of course not. Um, will Will there be, like, uh, a shaming? Probably. Will the uh, GOP go, yeah, what are you going to do? Um, you know, we still have a, we still have a child molester in committees. Um, <laughs> and they do. They do, they and do. And, a, and a couple of crazy people on top of well, that. Well, that's but, fine, but we all have crazy people. Uh, yeah. You guys um, <laughs> are crazy, and I'm going to tell you why. Tell me because, why. Because you guys expect a man who spends millions of dollars on golden toilets, who who bought those golden toilets with money he he got from scamming people who got fake degrees from a university under his name, uh, you expect him to not do this. That so you guys are crazy. <laughs> but I expected this stuff. I'm not surprised at all, and I won't be surprised tomorrow when we find out he did something else equally crazy. Because this is a man who spends millions of dollars on golden toilets with money he got from scamming people who bought fake degrees from a university. A fake university under his name. So you guys are crazy. Oh, let Eric. Eric? I, no, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, I, I, my hope was, yeah, I mean, I think this was, you know, this guy was a grifter and has been a grifter his entire life. And if you paid any attention, you knew that. I guess my hope and, and, and disappointment was I, I thought that Republicans would put some guardrails on him. That was my naivete of five years ago, I guess, that that would happen. And so I'm stunned that it hasn't because you're right, you know, and, and, and you're exactly right as a, as a behaviorist, as a psychologist, you're not going to tell someone as successful as him that he's doing something wrong, right? I mean, and he'll even tell you, I mean, he's transparent in that I, I was, I'm president of the United States when he was and you're not, you know, so trying to tell me I'm doing something wrong doesn't fit. So I agree with you 100%. On that, that's a mistake we make. The government around us, I'm just, I'm more disappointed in who has not, who has kind of allowed him to do this. Yeah, I agree. Um, back to the golden toilet thing. Uh, 
Um, cause, <laughs> cause good call. Fabulous callback. Um, how could a guy who buys gold, golden toilets still not be able to buy a pair of pants that fit? <laughs> I yeah, mean, I saw that photo this week. Yeah, yeah, from that photo this week where it looked like he had his pants on backwards or he was wearing something. I don't know. But the point being, the man is worth billions and billions. He's right. Whatever. But he's got enough money not to buy off the rack. Um, I buy <laughs> off the rack. I buy off. I'm the not rack. sure. I'm not sure that there's a that there's a tailor in the United States that can make him look good in a pair of pants. I find that hard to believe because I am not what you call a beautiful person. Um, and I have not, you know, I am not David. Um, uh, by you know, and I still find a suit that makes me look fine. Um, it's it's easy. You know. Maybe not everyone is as blessed with fashion as you, Greg. No, it's I. I, I wear. <laughs> Have you considered I, I, that, I, I, Greg? I, I, I've got six black suits. They're awesome. Do you know what's great about black suits? You, you you can wear them to a wedding. You can wear them to a funeral. You can wear them to a brisk. You can wear them to everything. Black suits, awesome. I I believe you have five too many. Because if you have one black suit, you only need one black suit. I, yeah, but, but night, one's wool. Is your night job an assassin? <laughs> I want to take the conversation back to <laughs> to politics and off of Greg's uh, uh, sartorial splendor because <laughs> the, I have a prediction. There are going to be investigations into this. I mean, one of the people that they tried to target was Representative Adam Schiff, and we all know that he's a fairly powerful man in the in the House of Representatives, uh, uh, like I said, uh, several well known reporters were targeted. Uh, hit, uh, Trump's own uh, White House counsel was targeted, and there is some question about the legality of all this. But where I think it's going to get interesting, I don't know whether you folks saw this on the news this week. Before all of this came out, while William Barr was still the Attorney General of the United States, he was questioned under oath in committee in the Senate uh, by one Senator Kamala Harris. And she asked him point blank if anyone in the Trump administration ever suggested that he investigate certain political opponents. And he fumbled, he hemmed and hawed. He pretty much lied because he clearly was asked to do it because he wouldn't have done it if he hadn't been asked, and it was his Department of Justice. And yet he he danced around that question. She let him a little bit off the hook at the end. I suspect that he will be called back to testify. I suspect he will refuse. I suspect they will then subpoena him because they can. I suspect he will then claim executive privilege. Now, here's the rub. For the first 230-some-odd years of this country, executive privilege could only be exerted when you are working for the president. Donald Trump is no longer the president of the United States. So most lay people and many attorneys would say executive privilege is, is not a thing if you're the former employee of a former president. I suspect that William Barr is going to say it does apply because there's no place in the laws or the Constitution that says that it doesn't. And how do we know that he won't be the president again someday? And I think that that case is going to go into the courts and possibly to the Supreme Court. And if my hunch is correct, and if Barr prevails, it will rewrite what executive privilege means in this country. So that's just a prediction. Do you guys think that I'm wildly off base or does that make sense? Let's hope not. We don't want any more golden toilets. <laughs> no, but I kind of I kind of see where his legal basis was or is going to be if he's going to claim that he has executive privilege with his time with Trump. If a doctor says I have doctor patient confidentiality when I was his doctor, it doesn't end when he's no longer his doctor. 
Good right? point. That's an argument that can be made. Yeah. And and granted, they will throw out any th- sort of nonsense. Now, granted, doctor-patient confidentiality ends when the patient dies, because I watch a lot of TV, and that happens all the time. I didn't know time. that, by the way. Well, supposedly. Um, that's, okay. that's, what, that's what Marcus Welby said, anyway. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's on Quincy all the time. Um, <laughs> um, and the millennials tune out. <laughs> Jack Klugman as someone other than Oscar. Oscar you know, Madison. Um, yeah. These were doctors, television doctors from the 60s and 50s. 70s. That they're quoting. Um, and 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, but who knows? Who, they, 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 I never made it to law school. What do I know? I, 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 I. To jump in on this, I think you're probably going to be correct. I think it's going to drag out, and my fear when it gets to Supreme Court that this is a this is this is not a great Supreme Court as a group. It's, that's an understatement. So I don't <laughs> think where we expect them to step up, much like they did to tie back to the Pentagon Papers. Remember, they were the ones who said Supreme Court. Yeah, that's right. Let the newspapers, let the Washington Post, and New York Times. Said you, can, this information is available to the country. It's I think it you know the press is to serve the governor, not the governors. I believe is what one of them said, Hugo Black maybe. So I think that's 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 the issue. I think you're right. Trump wants to he would drive this or Barr or someone would drive this to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's very friendly. From my sense, it's kind of short term, very very kind of right wing conservative issues, which is, again, back to your Amendment 1 versus Amendment 2 rights, correct? You know, it's like, pick your amendment. We'll fall on our sword. We'll fall on our guns for for uh, two. But the second. The second yeah. amendment, but the first, eh, we don't really care. If it's not, it's not impacting <laughs> us. Right. Right. It totally is, though, because they, they, they totally want to have every right to hold signs outside of soldiers' funerals that say God hates fags. So they totally want their First Amendment rights. And they want their guns. They want to be able to shoot people who who violate their ability to do so as well. Well, they want to also be able to, to not get banned off Twitter. And and they call that a First yes, Amendment right. Exactly. Right? Yes, exactly. They totally want their First Amendment rights and their Second Amendment rights. They just don't want us to have any of those rights. Right. Here, here. Well, um, I'm going to jump over a couple of topics that we had written down, and I want to end on something that's a little lighter fare, uh, not necessarily political in nature. Um, There's a lot of articles coming out now that are quoting a study, and I'm putting that in quotes. Greg will tell us why. But a study came out that said that... um, a lot of millennials and Gen Xers or Gen Zers, to me, they're all just young people, but wherever you fall in that category. But apparently young people are saying that um, one night stands are kind of going to be on the decline and they're being replaced by something called virtual intimacy, which quite uh, quite honestly, I'm not sure I understand what that is. Maybe someone here can can take me to school on that. But my question to you is, are we looking at a, um, a return to a slightly more Puritan version of sexual relations? Or because of the pandemic being over and people are ready to, to take their masks off now and, and party like it's 1999, are we looking at a new summer of lust? Okay, there's nothing pure about virtual intimacy. It sounds pure to me. <laughs> Well, what is virtual intimacy? Is it is it sexting? What is it? Yeah, it's it's sexting with video. Okay, but but video of yourself or video or or showing people porn. But but it could also be porn. It could be masturbating with porn. It could be any experience that's online, a sexual experience, whether it's with another person or just yourself, um, with an online experience. So. Okay, but again, let me play grandpa here and ask the, the question, the 800-pound gorilla in the room. How can that replace the physical act of having sexual intercourse? Um, I, I don't know if you heard that last part. It's the aspect of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, it's not the same thing. It's, it's, 
you know, I mean. Well, are you, are you referring to the 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 act of masturbating? Yeah, it's an or orgasm, right? You're right, that's it. It's 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 you're having an orgasm by yourself watching yeah. something versus having an orgasm with a person, yeah. hopefully close to you. Yeah, I, I've done them both. I don't see the comparison. Yeah. yeah. May I interject as as like the youngest person here? I know. You for, could always interject. I, I know. I know here. for a fact <laughs> that there exists a vibrator. That a person uh-huh. can wear and that it connects to a cell phone app and that another person can also wear the same brand of vibrator and that these two people can have sex from anywhere in the world with each other. That's through awesome. Through their cell phones. And they can also okay. video at the same time and chat at the same time and hear each other and see each other. And they can control each other's vibrators. So you tell me if that's real or not. Oh, it's virtual at the very least. Okay, uh, that's a that's another level of I, I would call that another level of masturbation. But but you know what? We can get into semantics. It's also a physical, uh, a satisfying physical act. And there's different types of vibrators and sex toys too. This is just one kind. I mean, you can right. have them in different versions and di- for different you know styles. <laughs> the, there was true. a there was a study um may, about 10 years ago i think maybe a little a little longer about the effects of pornography and uh high school boys okay and and no it didn't you know they didn't go blind or anything like that but what they were finding out was that a lot of boys weren't asking girls to prom I mean, they just weren't. And a lot of boys weren't dating um, because their expectation of not only relationships, but of sex itself were just so unrealistic and um, not real. Okay. And the, and when asked, they were like, why would I spend $20 on a date when, you know, I could date a girl that looks like a high school kid and they and they were like, but you're in high school. And he was like, right, exactly. When I could go home and masturbate to, you know, whoever, you know, and they're like, it just seems so much easier. Um, <laughs> and that seemed to be a problem. I mean, the numbers in the study were just ridiculous. Um, it, it made it seem like it was like, this is going to destroy America. It was like the reefer madness study of like 1920s. Um, now, I don't think porn is destroying America. I don't think, but, you know, it is something I have, I have, you know, talked to people who have told me that their high school years, they didn't date anybody. Um, and no, it's not me. I didn't have the internet I didn't in high school. Anybody. Um, oh, I had, I, I dated, I mean, even I was in the marching band. Of course I dated people. Um, <laughs> marching band was crazy. I was a drama geek. Of course I dated people. Yeah. The, okay. The, the arts were crazy. It's just like, it's just like libido city. Um, we're, the, we're the dirty librarians of high school. Oh, it's, 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 <laughs> I, it's it's just the worst. Um, but you know, I've talked to people who are like, I've I didn't date anybody because you know I didn't. It was just seemed like a lot of trouble. It seemed like a lot of effort, and and you know they missed out a lot. They missed out on a lot. You know, you know, almost. I, I you know, it's interesting to to you know. I, I spent a lot of time around college students and you know I don't follow them around but I but I do have a strong sense that when we take a break you know I kind of think back in the 60s people would take a cigarette break right classes there's a break in class go smoke a cigarette now you know the phones are out before you can finish the word break and there's a lot of communication and I'm very proud of my students I think my students are kind of a they're a very smart organized so I think they're kind of a cream of the crop and who we get. But even with that, their communication is through their phone. And and to call someone, to talk to someone is not their mode of communication. Even if it's almost a person sitting beside them, ironically, they would much rather text the person who's, you know, four feet away as opposed to call that person. So I do see this kind of a long term. I don't have a great answer to what's going to happen. I think you're you're right though, Greg. This is it's it's a lot easier to do it this way, right? You don't have to worry about rejection, which we know adolescent boys and young adult boys and old 
men, you know, worry. You worry when you ask them on and off they're going to go. And then the awkwardness of getting into a kind of a pre-physical and then physical relationship where you're going to get rejected. Is this going to go well? So it's a lot easier to just do it at home, right? Right. And not have right. to worry about those dynamics. But but there's something we learn in those too, right? We learn how to recover from rejection. We learn that you can ask someone out and they may say yes and the excitement of that. So I do think something's missing in this part, but unwanted pregnancies is not one of them, right? I mean, I do think though that whenever there's something different or new, um, people are always critical of something when there's a change or there's something different and we're fine. We're fine. (laughs) Things have always, when the, when computers came out, there was, you know, everyone was scared. We're fine. When phones came out, people were scared. We're fine. This is coming out, and we're going to be fine. Yeah, I'm not denying that. Uh, yeah, I'm not denying that that's the case. I mean, with us, it was the television, right? When television came along, it was like, it was the end of... Oh, the boob tube. Oh, my God, it's going to melt your brain. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. and and there was a, there was a comic book authority... Um, made because comic books were going to rock kids' minds. Um, because yes, I'm a nerd and I know that. Um, and the PMRC back in the um late 80, uh, early 90s, late 80s with Tipper Gore because rock and roll music was going to destroy us. Uh, Frank Zappa, Andy Snyder, uh, testified in front of uh, the Senate. Awesome, one of my favorite moments of C SPAN. Um, but we all turned out okay. Um, this was this was a great conversation. I'm glad we got into this. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to us. Uh, if you enjoy what we do here, please follow us on Twitter at MPU Podcast and on Instagram at MPU Fan Club. And don't forget to share our link on your Facebook timeline so your friends can discover us as well. And as we always remind people, if you like to talk politics or about any social or pop culture issues, Uh, Between shows, join us in our Facebook group, Open Fire Politics and Entertainment. We're all there uh, at various times, and we'd love to see you there, too. Uh, Eric, I want to thank you for for joining us. Greg, as always, I want to thank you, uh, and I want to thank your lovely wife for sharing you with us. (laughs) Lily, I want to thank you for joining us and for all of the great promos you've been putting uh, uh, out there for us. Oh, those are fabulous, yes. uh, Thank you. I want to thank the, the lovely Jessica for being sort of a, a shadow producer of this show, and, and uh, she recommended we have Eric on, and, and that worked out great, and she's recommended other guests. Yeah. And with that... Mm. Greg, so um, who will you be texting this week, and will there be any um, virtual intimacy? In it? I'm, I'm, it's funny you mentioned that. I'm actually going to text the Queen of England... Uh, because she's going to be shit talking about Trump after having such a fabulous uh, and enjoyable uh, visit from the Bidens. You know she's got the, that 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 hot bitch has all the hot gossip on uh, that. So and she, she you know it's going to be like yes queen. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing is listening to her. Just you know. there's that trashy mouth that we we we've come to to know you so famously for. I know, I know, I saved it all to the end. 